You're listening to this week's message from the Sunday Preview, a version of OSL's own The Shop podcast, where we discuss life, the faith, and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in the modern world. It's real talk about real faith in the real God. Welcome back to another Sunday preview here in McKinney, Texas. We are at the table. We are looking at the readings for this Sunday, August. I forgot to look. 27th. 27th. Okay. <laughs> seven days from yesterday. We record these on Monday. So seven days <laughs> from August 20th. So it's August 27th of worship. We're looking at our readings. I promise I will get this at some point. I don't I have problems with dates. So we're gonna, looking at our text here. I'm with Robin and I'm with David. We're going to get into it. Y'all a little nervous about how I'm a little off the rails today? We are now. We are now. Let's do this. Sometimes there's too much caffeine to be had and you have too much caffeine. You deal with it. All right. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 51 verses 1 through 6. It says this. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion, he comforts all her waste places, and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her thanksgiving in the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. For my righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out. And my arms will judge the peoples, the coastlands, hope for me. And for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke and earth will wear out like a garment. And they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever. And my righteousness will never be dismayed. So God kind of covers a lot of stuff here. And to kind of summarize what I hear God doing here, and then we'll dive into the actual details and the pieces is it's kind of like God says, I created you, you to be my people. I, God, turn your waste places into gardens. So your sin has created these waste places. I turn them into gardens. And then kind of the reality that everything around us that we can get so wrapped up in and consumed with is, is temporary. You had yet God is eternal and the things of God are eternal. The things God chooses to um, keep eternal like his promises continue. So I'll pause there and, and open this up, David, for your thoughts on this text and wh- where you dive in here. I think what jumped out to me was verse three, for the Lord comforts Zion. And just that image of he comfort, comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden. So context here is they're in exile. and. Cyrus the Great is about to set them free and defeat Babylon, but, but they're never really going to be free. They're just going to be ruled by another foreign ruler, but they will get to go home eventually. But, but their whole world has been made a waste place. I mean, Babylon invaded. They destroyed the temple. They burned down Jerusalem. They've been in exile. I mean, you can't get more, much more waste place than that. But just the promise of restoration. Um, that he will make it like Eden. Their desert will be like a garden of the Lord. And that, that garden makes me think of both Genesis 1 and 2, the original Eden, but then also all the way to the end of Revelation, that, that the Bible ends with this beautiful picture of um, a new heavens and a new earth. And, and, a, and there's so much garden imagery throughout it. So I don't know, I just, just the great comfort the Lord gives to people who are living in a desolate place but the promise of a future restoration. Yeah, that's a good dance back and forth between, anytime we look at Old Testament texts, we, we look at like the historical, actual, practical context of it, where they were physically being exiled and their, their surroundings were physically miserable. And then we kind of look at it in the context of like spiritually, like the life to come and, and what our physical reality will be through Jesus someday. And I like how we, we have to dance back and forth between those two and can't just live in one of them because of the, it, was, it was written in an p- applicable time in history. Robin? Well, I really like the end of verse 2. It just kind of stuck up, stood out to me. Abraham was only one man when I called him, but when I blessed him, he became a great nation. So this idea that 
God calls individuals, but then he's the one that does all the good through them. I just, I love that imagery and just the fact that he, like you were talking about, makes beautiful, great things out of brokenness, out of the mess that we've created. It's, it's a, it brings lots of comfort. Um, the title in the, this Bible that I'm using is A Call to Trust the Lord. It's a great thing to put trust in. Yeah. And, you know, it really picks up. That's a great point because it mentions Abraham, the father of the Jewish faith, but also Sarah, who was barren, right? Who didn't have Isaac until she was, I think, 90. Abraham was 100. Um, and, and so it just harkens again to this sense of they're living in a wilderness, and yet what hope? They can look back and see, man, God had made this promise to Abraham, but they had no hope of having a kid, and yet it was okay. God, out of that barrenness, brought a whole nation. And God, out of the barrenness they currently experience, he can do it again. And there's that overarching biblical theme of patience mm-hmm. and time. Because even you think about the child, well, it was at least nine months. And at least be patient there. And then you think of generations and generations. And, and even today, we can be in our, our wilderness, and yet there's often a time where God calls us to be patient and to, there, there's a time for his work to be done. Um, like you think, like look to the rock from which you were hewn. If you've ever watched people shape and work rocks, especially back in this time, it's a traditionally a very slow and often painful process to, to create something that's of use. And so there's just all throughout the Bible, there's this, this theme of waiting for God. Can God do it instantly? Sure. But oftentimes God has us waiting for his work. Very much a theme for the Israelites in their, their time. You were going to say? Oh, I was just going to say that God used the unlikely, unlikely people. I just, I love that here and all throughout the Bible. It's just people you wouldn't expect. And I think we miss that sometimes in ministry today. Mm -hmm. We overlook those that we don't think could do the job or fit for something. And instead, we shouldn't worry about that. If someone comes up saying, hey, we should help them, support them. You you, you mentioned that obviously these promises are looking forward. So the question that comes to my mind is, what does the exile do while waiting? And I think you see that in verse 4. Give attention to me, my people, God speaking, and give ear to me, my nation. Um, That's what we do while we're waiting. We we listen to the Lord. We pay attention to the Lord. Um, We take God's promise as being more real than our circumstances. I I love how he says at the end there, verse 6, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath. Well, the heavens and the earth, I mean, they've been around our whole life. They're showing no signs of going anywhere. And yet... To the Lord, he says, uh, they will, the heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and, and he's going he's gonna to remake it all. So we look at our circumstances as that's what's real. But the exile looks to God and God's word and says, no, that's what's real, and God will deliver on his promise. Yeah, and the reality that I think sometimes we can get wrapped up in science where the reality is, that we are going to live here forever and ever and ever and ever. And so we have to do things to live here forever and ever and ever. And yet even Christians can lose sight of this, that at some point God is going to restart it. Um, but it's challenging living in that way if all you've known is, is that. Right. But this is good perspective if we just think about just the task and the responsibilities and what I'm doing in my daily life. I like to see I like to see stories of history because I was watching something this morning about uh, this uh, five story townhouse in New York City and this guy that was super wealthy at the time had it designed and and it's beautiful and all this stuff and blah 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 and then I thought that cat's been dead for like sixty years that he thought he was really important at one point mm-hmm. so there's like this idea that oh I've got to look at but at some point we're done and then the world's going to keep going. Or God's going to, you know, whatever, do God's thing. But I think there's some, there's some humility in this for us and even for the people, I guess, in the time where this was written. is just God's, God's, God's doing what God's going to do and is going to do it to the history of time. You know, we use us sometimes as vessels, but a lot of times we're just kind of a, a, dot on the ma- a dot on the whole big long timeline and 
moves forward. What's your translation say at the end of six? This one says, the people of earth will die like flies. Does your say flies? No, it does. It just says uh, they will dwell in it and will die in like manner. Yeah, so this says... um, It'll, the people of the earth will die like flies. So when you were describing it, you just think about like a fly that gets in the car, like it's on a mission for whatever, and you're just get out, get out. Like no one, no one, it's nothing. It just that's an interesting children's Bible translation. What's well, the NLT? Not necessarily a children's Bible, but feels hateful. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that that impinges on my my feelings. No, it's it, it, that's a that's a good point. Where I think sometimes we garner too much importance in ourselves. And the NLT clearly says we're flies. And it says, but my salvation will last forever, which goes back to what you're saying is that should be our focus in all that we do. But if you've ever been laying in your bed at night with a fly buzzing right. around, it seems very pressing, very important. And it's actually not a lot of comfort to know, you know, the lifespan of a fly is really only three days because like, <laughs> no, I need to sleep now. But that's the point. Mm -hmm. That's the point is, no, we do persevere now because we do have a sure hope. Mm -hmm. And that fly will lay eggs in your ear. Oh, gosh. Nice. (laughs) You've watched a few too many Twilight Zones growing up, didn't you? Too much Discovery Channel. (laughs) I do think there's just a quick application here. I know there's a number in our church that are experiencing a sense of loss in regards to our nation and the direction of our nation right now. And and I think it's easy to kind of hope for the restoration of an America that, that I value, whatever my experience was that I hearken back to and, and the hope of the restoration of that. But, but again, I think Scripture calls us back to say our focus is not to be on what was lost, they're not to be on our present circumstances, but not even on a hope that God would restore America. God's not promised mm-hmm. to restore America, but a hope of Eden or even actually a better Eden um, that's promised in Revelation 21, that that's our true hope. And, and we can hope for things in, in the civil realm, but our ultimate hope has to be in what God's going to do for us. Yeah, and, our, and the truth of God's salvation is that it's intended for everyone, even people that we today see as our direct enemies. Mm-hmm. God hopes they repent and turn back to him. God wants everyone to seek faith. And, and there's some peace in verse 5. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the people. Like, that's, that's the beauty of our faith is that Christ came down, Christ dwelled 30 plus years, and then Christ has come, promised to come down again. And it's not that, well, work harder, climb that ladder, get, get righteous enough for levels of whatever you, you, you pursue, and then maybe you'll be near God. God has come down and God dwells within us in the Holy Spirit. And that's, I don't know all the religions of the world, but that sounds pretty unique. Someone prove me wrong. Someone email me. Prove me, prove me right. Prove me wrong here. Mark.bray at oslmckinney.org. Mark. oslmckinney.com. No. All right, let's jump ahead to our next reading here. It's going to be Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 33 and then spans through Chapter 12, verse 8, Paul speaking. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. In prophecy, in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. 
So this is one of those texts where, as a pastor, you draw this out of the lottery of the lectionary, and you think, what do I possibly preach out of all these options that are presented in this text? There's, there's a lot here, but I love the way it starts. Basically, who are you to know the mind of the Lord? I love that, like the Job text we had a couple of weeks ago, where, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? There's, there's something to recognizing the reverence of God as God in a world where we hold nothing reverent anymore. It seems like everything is fair game for uh, destruction and, and criticism and ridicule. Whereas this is, I like going back to this, and I also like going back to this because I like to point to this when I can't explain why God is doing something. I don't know the mind of God infinitely, my son. and I literally mean my biological son. <laughs> I don't know it. And there's certain ways of, of God and, and the things he does that I can only explain so far. And there's freedom in going, I can only go this far because it says so in the scriptures. So I'll pause right there and kick it to you, Robin. Well, like you said, there's so much here. The part that always stands out to me in this text is just not to be transformed into the world, mm-hmm. but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So it just draws me back to my mind and what I'm putting my thoughts on as a starting place for not conforming to the culture, customs of the world, things that draw me away from God. Yeah, the reality that someone said this in our Sunday school a couple weeks ago, she was like, I don't know if I'm just unique, but almost every one of my sins starts in my mind. And I said, you're in good company, (laughs) sister. We're almost all like that. And, and. There's, there's some text, I don't know what book it was, but I was counting the word mind in there. Um, but there's something about, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, where when our mind is centered on certain things, whether good or bad, it tends to drive our, our words and our actions. So there's something, there, there's something super important about the renewing of the mind in the Holy Spirit. David, your thoughts? It's important to note there too, I think. You will be conformed. Mm-hmm to the world, or you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Like, yep. Something like that. You know, it's, it's the old coach has said, it's kind of like riding a bike. You're either moving forward or falling down. It's like, <laughs> okay, thank you, coach. But, but it's true. The world is constantly pressing in on you. It's pressing in you to form you in a certain way. And the only way to resist that, the only way to be transformed is through, as you all have said, um, God works through the renewing of our mind. Which shows that there is some type of, yes, God's doing the work, but there is some kind of ownership I have in my life and how I'm living because I have this little tricky little thing called free will where I get to choose how I live. I can't make myself righteous, but I can certainly make myself a sinful dumpster fire. But, but I, get to, I get some kind of say as to what's about to come out of my mouth. I get some kind of say about what I do with my fist. It's... It's not just, oh, shucks, Holy Spirit, do your thing. And then I just sit there and go and live in my sin and then expect some kind of different result. And there's actually a little hope there because what we set our minds on, we actually have a lot of control over. Mm-hmm. Now, I can hear the objections and I can give the objections. I mean, as a, as a rattled mind, my mind's always moving around, popping. But even when I realize, oh, wait, I got distracted, I can choose at that point to simply return to what I want to focus on. And yes, with our, with social media, with the world we live in, we have shorter and shorter attention spans, but even there, you can still choose when you find yourself thinking of something that you don't want to think about, you can choose to say, oh, I'm going to shift now. I'm going to read this. I'm going to think of these words. I'm going to, I'm going to pray. I'm going, we actually have a lot of control, Mm -hmm. whereas most of life we have almost no control. Um, so it's interesting here. I think you're exactly right. I, and I actually find this hopeful that the Lord has told us, look, it starts in the mind, and you need to saturate your mind with God's Word and just come back to it again and again and again. And there's something the Spirit does with God's Word that He begins to reshape things, not only in our mind, but in our heart and in our fist even, that now our hands become not what leads us and drags us, but actually tools that that our will can control to bless and to serve. But the tricky thing is when you know that awareness about yourself and your mind and, and trying to change your thoughts, and then you actively realize you're not doing it, 
there's a bigger question about, well, why do I not want to turn my thoughts from whatever it is? And that's, that is something to really reflect on because there's probably a bigger root of sin inside of you. Yes, which yeah. I, that's a great point because it helps us see, okay, but the mind's not ultimate, mm-hmm. right? There's a heart or a will there that ultimately has to repent, mm-hmm. has to turn towards the Lord, and even in weakness to say, Lord, I, my mind is consumed with these worldly things. Help me. Mm-hmm. But like what you're pointing out, just knowing stuff, if my heart is still turned away from the Lord, doesn't result in transformation. Right. Yeah, and one of the hardest things, like I think for us Christians, it's easy to say the word repent. It feels very like, yeah, repentance. <laughs> but I think what's harder for us to say is, I am wrong, or I was wrong, or I messed up. Like those to me feel more everyday, more everyday life, or I am sorry. Yeah, that's some like liquid gasoline pouring down my throat words for certain people. Like that's a hard thing to say because it's, it is so convicting in the context of our world. Like in the context of our world, if you have someone in an office where they make a mistake, I can think back to my corporate world, would be like, oh, I made that error in that spreadsheet. Versus going, well, you know, let me, let me try to, and then you kind of just, but that's, those are hard words to speak. But when we do that, I think that's when, we, when, when God does some of the biggest work in us so that next time, because guess what? You're going to mess up again. You're going to do something again the rest of your life, probably at least once a week that you're going to have to say, oh man, I messed that up. I hurt that person. I got to go fix this. When we can't say those words, in my view, it feels like this prison cell where the whole world sees you mess up, but you're the only one stuck in that prison cell being unable to say, up, oh, I was wrong. Mm-hmm. But there's freedom because once we say I'm wrong, then there's the, that church word to get repentance. And then there's that restoration God doesn't go, just repent, and then, Haha, look at you, sucker. No, he then picks us up and builds us back up in his love. And think how all those different expressions of repentance you just listed, right? I was wrong, I messed up, I'm sorry. How different that sounds than, say, like a married couple, I don't mean to turn this into a counseling session, but if you've ever had a spouse say to you, I'm sorry you got your feelings hurt. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, it, it's that... Okay, but you're not really sorry, are you? You're right. sorry you're having to deal with my hurt feelings, but you're not, you haven't, you don't think you did anything wrong. You haven't mm-hmm. taken any ownership right. of what the actions were. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you why I'm not wrong. And while you're just too sensitive. <laughs> Good old challenges. So, and, and so what I like it that as this, this text kind of, there's again, a ton in here. Um, what I like is how it kind of gets to the end, towards the end where it says, There's different gifts, like verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. Several things. The one, the gifts we are given are given by God graciously. God blesses us with different abilities and different uh, skills and different ways to serve him, and he does it by grace. It's kindness to us. But there's also what I read of that is no one can do everything well. Like no one can do everything well. And if you, if we attempt to do that, if I go out and attempt to, uh, I don't know, sing on Sunday mornings, folks are going to be hurting. It's going to be painful. But, but in this, I think there's this, this great idea within our, or this great reality within our faith of being able to say, I need help or I can't do this. And when we get to that point, there's, there's a freedom in that because then you start, then a beauty of, of a Christian community is, Hey, maybe there is someone that can help. Maybe there is someone that that does know how to do this. Every day I go, every time I go in the preschool over there and I'm in their classroom for 10 minutes and then I leave and I'm like, Lord, have mercy. I think, wow, I could not be in it for eight hours, but there are teachers that are so gifted in doing this. Praise God for their skill set. Because if it wasn't for them, there would not be a school here because I couldn't do it. And embracing the gifts we have been given. And then looking for ways to say, I need help with something is, I think that's, that's beautiful in the ministry or in that just You just life. brought up the, kind of the other part of it. So the part you just spoke to is recognizing, I don't have to do it all. There's others who are gifted and I can turn to them and rely on them. But then you also just said, also accepting the gifts I've been given. Mm-hmm. So this also says, when he says in what, verse three, 
not to think more highly than you ought to think of yourself, but to think with sober judgment. But that sober judgment is not, oh, I'm just a just a poor right. little sinner. I can't really do anything. I'm just, you know. But no, it's it's acknowledging, okay, well, it seems like the Lord has given gifts. He probably didn't leave me out of all the people. And so there isn't a recognition of well, how can I serve? Mm-hmm. I'm going to rely on others to help me where I am weak. But then perhaps I need to look at and say, okay, but what do I have to offer? Right. With the faith, everyone has something to offer. Right. And I, what came to mind there when you were saying that is some of the guys that make up our facilities team here, where they're like, I've got time, I've got resources, I've got knowledge, I've got energy. What can I do? It's not glorious work. Like, like one guy was out painting uh, the stripes on our, on our uh, parking lot one, one Saturday. It's not, it's not celebrated glorious work, but someone's got to do it. And he has a paint roller and a body that can get on the ground and roll, roll paint. So while that may seem like unimpressive, who cares what the world thinks? That's, that's a wonderful way of serving and blessing other people with your time and energy. It doesn't have to be amazing to bless people within the ministry and within God's, God's family. I also think that there's a little bit of a trap here to, to be careful about because sometimes we think, okay, this is my gift. So this is what I can do. And that's all I can do. But all throughout the Bible, God reveals people's gifts in areas they didn't expect it. So I think trusting in God, he's going to give you the gifts you need for the circumstances that you're in to do his will. So I think don't eliminate ideas because no one said you're good at it or you've never tried it before. Which takes my mind back to sober judgment. When I read that, I think, be honest with yourself. There may be something you can stretch beyond what you think you can do. It just may be a learning curve for a while. It just may be some uncomfortable learning in a bit in that stage. And it's important. I think that's such an important point because I think of Jesus washing the disciples' feet and saying, go and do likewise. Guess what? No one has the gift of foot washing, it turns out. (laughs) No one wants that job, right? And so there's there's a lot of stuff that we just need to do because we serve, Mm -hmm. right? We may not be, it may not be our gift, but there is still this call to sacrificial service. Um, So I appreciate you adding that to adding that in. Yeah. I always go back to the verse work is a working for the Lord, not man. Because if you're working for man's praise in whatever your vocation is, you're going to be let down. But when, and you're going to get bitter. uh, I mean, especially if you work in the secular space where you're working in environments where Praise and adoration often are only tied to dollars and, and that type of stuff. And you can, you can get into this grind where you're just fully bitter with the vocation you've given, but it's hard to think, okay, I'm working for the Lord in this because I'm providing, I'm doing, but that's, there's also a joy in that and a freedom in that, but it's a constant going back to it to remind the mind. All right, let's go to our gospel. So Matthew 16 verses 13 through 20. So this is, a, this is one we've been sitting on for several weeks after I think Peter brought this forth in our staff sharpening, the Caesarea of Philippi. All right, so this is Matthew 16, 13 to 20. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you're the Christ, Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. All right, David, you're going to take us into this. Initial thoughts. Well, obviously, two key questions. Who do people say the Son of Man is, but who do you say that I am? So I I find that helpful that Jesus leads them in this conversation. First, let's take a survey, right? Do you understand your context in the world in which you live and how people are viewing Jesus, right? So that's the first part of it. But of course, that's a huge but. But who do you say that I am? And ultimately, it comes down to not this is what my church believes, or this is what my pastor says, or this is, it comes down to what do you believe? 
who do you, what do you say about Jesus? And ultimately, everything depends upon that. And so Jesus puts him on the spot. Who do you say that I am? And obviously, Peter, this is where Peter, one of, the, one of the few times he gets it exactly right. Now, he didn't understand fully what he was saying, but his answer was exactly right. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. She makes it very personal. Who do you say that I am? It's like he's block out all that you've been told, block out all the, uh, the support you have, and I want to hear from your heart, put a stake in the sand here, draw a line, and tell me, Peter, who do you say I am? It's almost like you could almost picture Christ staring only at him and everyone else kind of fades out or blurs out into the distance where it's just he and Jesus. And yet even Jesus knew from his heart where he really stood on the whole thing. But Jesus often does that, doesn't he? He often kind of pulls people along to get that thread of genuine faith to, to come out. Robin? Um, I, I was looking at verse 17. And um, after that response, Jesus replied, well, your translation is slightly different, but you are blessed. And then it goes on, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. So it's just a reminder that we're blessed because God gives us this revelation about our Savior. Um, And I think that's something we often miss. Especially when we just sit in Christian circles. Mm -hmm. It's amazing when you sit across from people who don't have this, the, you know, the eyes of the Spirit, the faith, you know, the way the Spirit enables us to see the gospel is truth. And you tell them the gospel story, and they look at you like you're telling them some kind of fable, because all the parts together just don't make logical sense. Even when you're telling kids sometimes, like when the preschool, they kind of look at you like, seriously? This doesn't sound, which speaks to the Spirit, the spirit grants us the ability to believe and to believe is truth. But then it always leads me to that that hypothetical question that always comes up after that is, well, how come the Heavenly Father hasn't revealed it to everyone? You know, that question that goes out there to the world. I play the cynic in the Because there's background. hard-hearted scallywags. Yeah. <laughs> Which that's the, that's the uh, that then go, takes me back to, was it, was it our, uh, our Romans text where it's like, for who has known the mind of the Lord? Mm-hmm. Why, why? I don't know. I don't know why there are people. I mean, sin clouds the view of man and creates a hard heart. Why God doesn't break that heart in, in to, to turn to him, I don't know. What would you venture on that, David? I think of the parable of the soils, getting a little bit, you're talking about a hard heart, but, but the, the sower sows the seed. The word goes out, but it doesn't all land on the same kind of soil. So it does seem to matter, the hardness of the heart, the weeds that grow up, the busyness of life that can distract. Um, I'm, I'm certain there are people who, who God has revealed himself to, mm-hmm. and yet um, because of the condition of their soul, they immediately turned away from that or shut that down or check their social media scroll just to kind of avoid that or whatever it might be. Um, and, and so I, there is a warning in there of mm-hmm. of. We, we dare not neglect this revelation that we're not going to come to by pure reason, right? We are dependent on the Lord, and when the Lord reveals himself, that, that we want to respond to that. And there's also the beautiful reality of our faith where the Spirit, I believe, the Spirit never stops chasing. So, like, I, I know we have lots of folks who, who have either grown kids or even whatever it may be, or family members where they're like, yeah, they've nothing but rejected the faith. They're, they're, ag- they're agnostic, they're atheist or whatever. Um, they're hopeless. Maybe it seems like that with our logical minds and all the efforts we put forth, but we never know when God is going to crack that shell. And it may be their last few minutes of life on this earth while they're laying in a hospital bed. That may be the moment where they cry out and finally confess and believe and turn to the faith. I think we as, as disciples are, are encouraged by the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit to be that consistent planting of the seed. You never know where God is going to actually go click and faith blooms. But, you know, it's a great question because I think of, that's the question Paul was addressing in Romans 9 through 11, right? That the, the, 
Israel had God's law, they were God's chosen people, they had the promises, they had everything. Why hadn't they believed? Messiah came, why didn't they believe? And, and Paul's wrestling with that. I mean, and he really is wrestling because his heart is for them to believe. And that's God's heart, right? It's God, God's not playing games of like, oh, I revealed myself, but oh, you missed it, sorry. You know, God is constantly revealing himself. His word is constantly going out. And his heart is, I think, if you just, as you describe, Mark, is for us. It is calling us. It is pursuing us. It is inviting us. Um, that's God's heart for us. And we don't fully understand why many people turn a cold heart towards God, but they do. And it, that goes back to what saying it, I think it's the Old Testament text, where we, we in our ever-growing impatient society have to be patiently persistent with the gospel. And maybe we do it with words, or maybe we just do it by the way we live, but we're, we're in an age where we're used to things being very, very fast. And if they're not very fast, then we shut them down and we move on from it. Whereas the gospel and the faith has never, oh, oh, let me reverse that. It has, <laughs> but the gospel and the faith is often a slow process of bringing people to faith, especially today when there's all this stuff, these other ideas in our, in our view we often have to bring the gospel in a very slow, consistent pace for them to come to faith. So I guess all what I'm saying here in the big picture is if you have someone like that in your life and you're thinking they're a hopeless lost cause, continue to be present, continue to share God's word and love and respect and kindness, like it says in First Peter, and, and just keep doing that. Focus on that as, as difficult as may be, but focus on that and then wait for the, wait for the Spirit, wait for God to act. Well, verse 20 kind of speaks to that to me a little bit because this one says, then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So they have to be patient. Me, I read a verse like that. and I'm like, no, no, tell everybody, let everybody know. So those verses are frustrating to me because that's not what I would want to hear. And so those are, I take that as a good reminder of this is God's plan. This is his timing. Wait and then move forward. Right. Right. Resist fast forwarding. Yeah. And I can see the disciples going, go again, <laughs> again, really? Come on. Thank you, teenage Mark. <laughs> teenage Mark. I wasn't going to say a different person. <laughs> <laughs> we'll discuss this post. I don't know what she's talking about. All right. Any final thoughts on this? All right. Let's wrap it up here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us every week. Um, if you have questions or you want to be a part of the Sunday preview, uh, we have a ministry fair coming up August 27th. 7th. See, dates again, struggle. That's Sunday. August 27th. The next this, one. The very next one. This next Sunday. Yes. Man, this is getting ridiculous, folks. This next Sunday, we have a ministry fair. And one of the things you can come talk to me about is a Sunday preview about participating on this. And I will tell you, it is not intimidating. You don't need to come in here with like this deep theological training. Just come and talk about the word like you would with anybody else sitting on your front porch drinking well, coffee. Come ask or questions during the podcast. Sure. Sure. Come up here and just riddle Pastor Thompson with difficult questions. <laughs> I'll just moderate. All right. Y'all have a good one. We'll catch you next time.